Okay. Hi, I'm Uma. Um, so I'm going to start really basic. I see some of you who've actually done my class before. So I apologize to you in advance. But uh, somehow for me, uh, it's easier to understand things from scratch. So, so OK, so you guys are all here for this population genetics preparatory school. It sounds very serious. <laughs> so what is population genetics? What's population genetics? That's one aspect of it. Okay, let's step one. Let's go back one step. What's evolution? Change with time. Of what? Okay, so change in allele frequencies with time. Okay, so now what is population genetics? Evolution is change in allele frequencies with time. Population genetics is actually just a theoretical framework which quantifies this change in allele frequency with time. You are all kind of trying to describe why do frequencies change over time. We'll get to that. But basically, the definition of population genetics is very broad. It's a mathematical, theoretical framework to quantify how allele frequencies change over time. Okay. So evolution, you know, you can observe evolution at the level of the phenotype. You can observe change in a phenotype, right? Uh, but that change in phenotype is what underlies it is change in allele frequencies. And why allele frequencies change? Why do they change? Huh? OK. Selection. OK. Drift. What else? Migration, and mutation. OK, so luckily for us, there aren't many drivers in population genetics. Uh, there's nominally four. And these four processes result in change in allele frequency over time. That is selection, drift, migration, and mutation. OK. So now, basically, what I will do today uh, and on Friday, I guess, is to just show you the quantitative basis to for each of these individually, whether it's mutation, whether it's drift, whether it's selection, how does that impact change in allele frequencies? So our currency in population genetics is first allele frequency and then change in allele frequency over time. Fine. So before we get started talking about change, we have to confront this idea of allele frequencies itself. We use the term very blithely, but what does it mean? What's an allele? You guys had a whatever uh, discussion about that yesterday, I guess. What's an allele? OK. Allele is a variant of a given gene. OK. That sounds molecular. I mean, in the sense. Uh, yeah, so it's like, so what does that mean? 
how does it look then no an allele and anyone else just jump in huh? you saying it can be taken as a phenotype no allele yeah Mm, what does that mean? Phenotype is okay. So you guys already studied phenotype. Phenotype is very easy, na? You don't have to use big words. What is phenotype? What you look like, no? What it looks like, whatever it is, right? And what is genotype? Are these connected? Or well, there's no connection. There has to be a connection. That's why we're talking about evolution as what we see change in phenotype driven by underlying changes in genotype. Okay. There has to be a connection. So does phenotype determine genotype? The other way around, right? Genotype. Determines entirely phenotype? No. There's other things like environment and so on, right? Sorry if I see, if seem like I'm going off on tangents. But the idea is this genotype, this phenotype is a biological thing, right, that you see. And we talked about genes and we said genes determine this phenotype. And you talked about an allele as did you say a variant or let's call it alternative forms of a gene? Okay. And how do we read genes? What are genes? They are DNA, right? That's why I said it's molecular. Because we can read DNA, we can read DNA sequence. We do that in the lab or whatever. We can extract DNA, we can read DNA, we can understand or copy DNA. We can look at the sequence of DNA. But population genetics doesn't necessarily deal with sequences, right? It deals with. Ah. Yes. No, it's not closed. Loop is not closed, yeah. 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 So basically, yes. Selection acts on the phenotype, right? So, however, different genotype combinations result in different phenotypes. Different genotypes, not combinations. Different allele combinations, right? Result in different phenotypes. And that kind of harks back, this link harks back to genetics and heredity, the study of how do genes inter, that's molecular, right? How do different alleles of a gene interact? Because there's some protein stuff happening, no? Between the DNA and whatever's interacting with them, and then what you look like. What you look like seems like very macro. Someone brought up this macro and micro. It's very macro. The DNA seems very micro, right? But allele frequencies are also changed by something like selection, which acts directly on the Phenotype, right? Does selection see the genotype? What is selection? What is selection? Uh, how about saying something like differential survival of individuals because of differential fitness, right? And differential fitness is conditioned on phenotypes, right? Certain phenotypes have a higher fitness in certain environments than other phenotypes. And then because that is the case, the frequency of those phenotypes will increase. But I wanted to, I can get back to that, but you know, before we talk about all of that, much more basic itself is these alleles. Okay, selection acts on adults or maybe 
post birth pre birth also to some extent but generally on things right drift we'll talk about in the afternoon is really acting on the alleles and it's a very it's a very theoretical process selection is uh, you can i mean you can't see it but it feels like that right because it's about survival viability so on so forth migration also seems to be a very tangible thing right migration is mixing or moving or something like that mutation is again very molecular it basically creates new alleles but all of this together changes allele frequencies but if these these are called micro evolutionary forces they drive evolution by the way what's macro evolution anyone want to take a guess evolution can be studied in other ways as well na for example you could study fossils you could study changes in communities over time with fossil records right that's macro evolution you could look at say a dinosaur assemblage over time and you could quantify changes in some fifth tooth over time right that's also evolution change in the fifth tooth of the dinosaur x over y million years that's also evolution of a phenotype but you may not be able to get to the alleles in that case right in micro evolution we go bottom up that's macro evolution is kind of top down you're looking at phenotype and change over long evolutionary time scales micro evolution we say we start with the alleles and we look at change okay we start with the alleles yeah no selection does not have a mind <laughs> selection operates on the phenotype okay okay yeah so yeah so for example uh, say that you know uh, a common example of say birds and a drought okay uh, there's a lot of heuristic arguments which suggest that the shape of a bird's beak determines the size of seeds it can eat okay so now there's a so there's a bird which has a small sized large sized beak so it eats large seeds <coughs> and for some reason it can't eat small seeds as efficiently there's a drought on an island and all the trees which have large seeds die so now what's going to happen to this bird what kind of cell what will happen let's just talk it out okay i mean very basic i'm a, i do things very basic so just talk it out you're going on this island the birds are starving right that's the first thing they're not able to eat the small seeds okay but because there is genetic variation if there's no variation at all all be all birds have identically huge beaks they are all dead right that's like a disastrous event for that species on the other hand it could be that beaks are distributed like this right this is frequency some birds have large beaks some birds have small beaks in general quantitative traits things which are controlled by multiple genes are distributed like this okay and they have to be because they are controlled by multiple genes because of central limit theorem so fine so these birds are all dead okay so now if there is a genetic basis for beak size right first of all only these will survive so then what will happen in the next generation if this was the average beak size b a what will be the beak size in this generation only after the death of those birds the distribution of the leftover birds i just chopped off half of it na how will it look 
if this is b a will it be more than b a the average it will be less right so maybe something like this or something like that okay now if you go back to that island in two years that's like say the next generation for the birds what do you expect to see so suppose i go back after two years and i see this distribution of beak size did you guys get that am i losing you huh no change no change drought is still there drought is persistent all the big seeded trees are dead but i still see that huh exactly beak size has nothing to do with genes right because whatever it was they died there's new ones the selection did not change the beak size at all right however why are we saying that so if these guys are left now they are going to breed with each other hmm what does it mean to say there's a genetic basis for a trait huh it's heritable how does that look if you were to plot the phenotype of the parent and the child how would that look if i had i measured beak size of parent i measured beak size of child and the paired observations i plot them if there is heritability if there's a genetic basis how will this scatter plot look yeah there will be some correlation by the way the slope of that line is called heritability right how heritable is a trait it could be only 50% 50% of your trait is determined by your genes 50% by the environment and so on i'm going off on a major tangent but basically if there is breeding here because there's no other birds okay it's possible someone might say some helicopter came and air dropped some large beaked birds that you'll have to explore right as other options but if you go back to the island and the next generation you see this okay that is a very strong response to selection where selection is acted on the phenotype have you seen any allele here have you no nothing you saw you just went to the island you saw the dead trees you saw the birds you measured their beaks you went to the island the trees are still dead you measured the beaks but you are inferring that there is a genetic basis because the beak size is now small right but you have not seen the alleles right so that's why in some sense selection is top down you may never see them also you may never know what they are uh but you can do a model where you say uh, yeah go ahead yeah yeah nahi nahi you went once okay you had you saw you heard about a cyclone and that the trees were dying this is your favorite bird you went you had been studying that bird for your phd you had measured beak size and all you heard about this storm cyclone you went again you saw the birds uh, the trees were dead and there were these birds which were dead which had big beaks okay so now you could plot then dead birds birds alive beak size so you had this which was you know your first year of phd or whatever you had this which was at the beginning of your second year you're like oh my god cyclone my phd is gone and then you have this year 3 or 4 or whatever assuming a generation time of one year where you see that beak size is a become small i mean this is a very extreme example or it is changed okay yeah 
Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing is, what, what's happening is that the birds who are mating and they're having babies and all, but the baby's beak size seems to have nothing to do with the parent's beak size. So there's no correlation between how big your beak is compared to how big your father's or mother's beak was. It's very, I mean, uh, by the way, uh, we talk a little bit about selection, but what's really interesting is that actually for quantitative traits, selection need not be very high. In fact, fitness related traits tend to have lower heritability, sorry, not selection, lower herit high selection on fitness related traits, but low heritability actually. On an average, 50% only. That's something you can think about. Why might that be? So I'll say it again. So obviously, now here, if there's high heritability of beak size, then the children of the surviving birds would have the traits which enable their parents to survive. Right? So it's good, isn't it? However, so that would mean that if heritability is high, if heritability is high, the child's beak looks very similar to the parent's beak, right? If heritability is low, it's a toss-up. Could be a big beak, could be a small beak, right? I'm telling you that fitness-related traits tend to have low heritability. Huh? No. That is for, yeah. Yeah, so basically not all traits have the same heritability. Some traits have higher heritability, others have lower heritability. Fitness rate like clutch size, uh, number of eggs laid, things which are very good proxies for fitness or used as proxies for fitness tend to have lower heritability. So, so for example, like in Drosophila, bristle number, huh? which one? Height is not a fitness related trait. Yeah, that has high heritability, but it's not necessarily a fitness related trait. Yeah, but something which is much more closely linked to fitness, like linked to reproduction, like clutch size in birds, number of eggs you have, number of eggs in Drosophila, something like that has a low heritability. So that seems like a conundrum, right? Yeah. Once the drought is over and the conditions, if it has such a high heritability, again it would not come back to the original advantage. Great, that's great. So basically, environment keeps changing, right? And if you're so locked in, heritability is so high, patak, everybody will have small beaks in no time, and that could predispose you to end up with extinction because maybe there'll be no drought and then the seed size will be different. So variation is always good to have and there's a little bit of buffer if you have that lower heritability you can you know adapt when the environment changes anyway we can talk about it we're not supposed to talk about selection today but the idea is that selection is top down and bottom up though so yeah so linking top down to bottom up can be done through quantitative through population genetics okay because we'll make an assumption so population genetics is all about assumptions. What we talk about alleles, they're not real pieces of DNA all the time. Sometimes they are, but many times they're not. We don't know what they are. We just think there may be two alleles, there may be three alleles, there may be five alleles or whatever, right? And we link this change in allele frequency. I mean, we quantify this selection pressure and we can link it to change in allele frequency. We'll talk about that on Friday. But before that, we'll just talk about a situation, the most basic one, where there's none of these happening. There's no selection, there's no mutation, there's no migration, there's no drift, okay? So that situation is called, again, see everything in population genetics is a very idealistic, uh, theoretical construct. 
this is an ideal population infinite in size you know all that stuff and none of these processes happen and when you have none of these happening it's basically no evolution right you have something called hardy weinberg equilibrium so we'll talk about that but basically i just maybe this may seem a little childish but we have these beads and these are our alleles okay and each of you is going to pick two and then we'll calculate what the allele frequency is i'm not sure if i have enough you can pass around the bag because you, we are all diploids right what does that mean we have two sets i mean every chromosome has two uh, pairs has a pair so we get one from our mother and one from our father so these are your alleles now so just pick two so imagine now this is a pool of gametes okay this is a infinitely large pool of gametes and a particular population or the offspring in the next generation are assembled through these alleles if you run out tell me i have more wasn't sure exactly how many people there are and so now we're going to talk about what is allele frequency okay how do you calculate it what should it be can you predict it in the next generation what about genotypes okay very basic questions before we start talking about change in allele frequency because of drift and mutation and all this stuff we need to know what is the base allele frequency how do you calculate it what does it look like i'll erase these while quickly so if we can move on Hmm. We'll talk about drift in the afternoon. It's a theoretical construct because it's a stochastic process. You see the effects of it. We'll talk about it. <laughs> you 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 can predict its effects, but that's the problem with evolution: is what you see in the world is one instance of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are there enough? So now imagine, is that you are you are doing your PhD again? Okay, most of you are PhD students, right? Yeah, some undergraduates, You're undergraduate. <laughs> oh, you have a question? Okay, yeah, tell me. Yeah. Yeah. 
So what does that tell you? Given that what we observe in nature is that fitness related traits have low heritability, what does that tell you about the environment? It changes a lot. That's what it tells you. Huh. Okay, still any be all done? So now when we talk about genotype, right? What is genotype? We have three alleles. How many alleles do we have? You guys are all now birds. How many alleles are there? How many alleles are there? Okay, what colors do people have? Anyone with purple? Purple. Anyone with uh, pink? Pink. Anyone with yellow? So there are three alleles? Three colors, right? So what are the genotypes? There are three alleles. So this was the swarming pool of gametes, which you all, you're all individuals, you got stuck with two alleles each, right? So that's the construct of theoretical population genetics. There's a swarming pool of gametes, and each individual gets stuck with two alleles because they're deployed. So now you are grown up and you all have two alleles, right? So I'm a biologist and I come to this population. My advisor says, please tell me what is the allele frequency? What are the genotype frequencies in this population? Okay. So what are the three alleles? Alleles are pink. Purp oh shoot, okay, pink, purple, and yellow, fine, three alleles, how many genotypes, what are genotypes, sorry, what was genotype, combination of, because you're deployed, you're going to be stuck with two, right, so the combination, okay, so can you please tell me, now what are, there are two kinds of genotypes, what are the two kinds of genotypes, yeah. So what are the homozygous genotypes? Purple, purple. Pink, pink. Yellow, yellow. And the heterozygous? Purple, pink. Purple, yellow. Uh, pink, yellow. Fine. So six possible genotypes. Okay. So now, can you go from here to here? That is, I want to know how many individuals are there which are homozygous, how many individuals are there which are heterozygous, how many pink pink, how many purple purple. Actually, forget about this for a minute. You are all adults, right? You all are adults with genotypes. So what would I do? If I had to find out the different genotypes, what would I do? I'll count them, no, somehow, right? How I get that information, like if I don't know the DNA sequence, I can't do it. But suppose I can. So, fine. So how many people are uh, pink, pink? One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, no, no. Did I count you? Sorry. One, two, three, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Okay. Purple, purple. Oh, one, two. Oh, sorry. One, two, three, four. Only four. Yellow, yellow. Zero, no one, huh? Not a single person. Okay, fine. How about purple? What was this? Pink. Purple, pink. Oh wow, lots of heterozygotes. Okay, one, two, three, four, 
5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Purple, yellow. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, pink, yellow. 1, 2, 3, 4. So, 26, 30, 40 people are there, huh? roughly. There are 40 people. Not roughly, exactly. <laughs> okay, fine. So now, how do I calculate? This is genotype frequency. Huh? How do I calculate the frequency of yellow? You are going to now go into the next generation. Nah? You are going to dump all your gametes back into this swirling pool of gametes, which is going to form the next generation. So how do I calculate? in that swarming pool of gametes, what proportion will be yellow? Half of? This one? Oh. Divided by? Divided by the total into two. You have 10 into 2. Okay, okay. Forget the theory. Suppose you are pink yellow. How many yellows you have with you? No. If you're pink yellow. Hey, you're pink yellow. Look at your alleles. Look. Yeah, you're an individual with a genotype. <laughs> you have one. Right. Okay. So total number of alleles amongst all of you people is how much? 80. 80, right? Because each person has two. There are 40 people. So let's, just for consistency, the total number of alleles is 80. So the probability or the proportion of pinks, let's not call it probability, it's not a probability. The proportion of yellows is 4 plus 6 by 80. Okay, the proportion of purples, <coughs> which is what? 1 by 8, yeah? The proportion of purples is 16 plus 6 plus 8 by 80, which is, can someone calculate? Which? 3 by 8. <laughs> 3 by 8, okay. Can you guess what the proportion of pinks should be? Half. Let's see, is that correct? Pinks, 10, 20 plus 16. Yeah, fine. Fine. So these are the three. These are the, what are these now? These are the allele frequencies, right? The allele free, so the allele frequency of pink is half, purple is 3 by 8, and yellow is 1 by 8. Very simple, right? So now tell me, without going through this whole rigmarole, in the next generation, what proportion of the population will be pink, pink? So we got this. What is allele frequency? Yes. How do you calculate it? We did it. What should it be in the next generation? Let's leave that for now. What about genotypes? We did that. So the, okay, by the way, this is a good question. So now you're dumping all of your gametes back into that swirling pool. Should the allele frequency change for the next generation? No reason, right? There's no reason it will change. Can you now think of how selection works? If there's viability selection, all the pink, pink birds died, right? Then their gametes never make it back into that pool, right? 
That's why the allele frequency changes. Okay, forget that now. But nothing is happening. No selection, no drift, nothing. So, do you think the allele frequencies will be different in the next generation? No, should be the same. If it is the same, can you tell me what proportion of the individuals will be pink pink? Why? Why? Huh? So you have that swirling pool again. You want to you want to get a genotype which is pink pink, which means you pull one pink. What's the probability of that? Half and another pink. Half into half. The only way to be pink pink is to pull exactly two pinks, right? 1 by 4 into 1 by 4 is half. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> All done. Okay. Now, let's look at a heterozygote. I won't work through the whole thing again. What about pink, purple? One by two? One by two into three by eight? Yeah, why is it into two? You could pull pull pink, purple, or purple, pink, and because it's or, you have to add them, right? Does that make sense? It sounds very basic, but it's important to understand. So two into one by three, sorry, three by eight into? One by two. Fine. So this is how you would calculate allele frequencies and genotype frequencies from generation to generation. And Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium predicts, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is valid when there are no microevolutionary forces, nothing is changing allele frequencies. And what Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium predicts is, if you have two alleles, P and Q, the genotypes are in this proportion, okay? P square, 2PQ, Q square. If there's three alleles, A, B, C, it's A plus B plus C whole square, right? A square, B square, C square, 2AB, 2BC, 2AC, right? So it's very simple. So Hardy-Weinberg is a zero evolution population. There's no evolution happening because allele frequencies are not changing. Every generation, generation to generation, because there is a non-biased dumping of gametes into this homogeneous pool where they're all mixed and then pulled out, the allele frequencies are unchanged. Okay, now, obviously that's nonsense. I mean, that doesn't happen, right? <laughs> so, what are the things which you know from, or you can think of from biological systems which you've seen, which might, apart from, we talked about, okay, how would, how would uh, selection alter this? We just discussed it, right? Yeah. Suppose individuals, the specific genotype just die, right? Okay. So then they don't want to be, yeah. So Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is just that allele frequencies do not change over time and can be predicted by this equation that basically all the alleles P plus Q equals 1, okay, and these genotypes are determined exactly by the fact that you sample them, right? So you have two P's is P square, and it's exactly P square, and it doesn't, doesn't change across time, okay? So P plus Q is equal to 1, is important because suppose you have a mutation, right? Then you have P, Q, and P prime, some new allele. That doesn't satisfy Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium because now P plus Q plus P prime equals one, right? There's no allow, no room for change of any kind, fine? So now uh, what other, what about drift? What is drift? Huh? 
it's sampling yeah so you guys all pulled out from that bag right so suppose you had huh? sampling is random but because it's random a particular sample you may end up with specific alleles like suppose I was only pulling three alleles okay so what is the probability of pulling three pinks would be something just by chance because yellow is rare the probability of pulling three yellows one after the other is very low right so that is drift in a sense we'll talk about it more in the afternoon how you can quantify it and stuff but basically drift will lead to change in allele frequencies as well migration of course very easy to understand you have a new allele entering the system right or it could be a population with a different allele frequency now these alleles are coming in to your base population same for mutation there's a new allele created what else what other things could result in a violation of hardy weinberg equilibrium huh what's inbreeding No, no, okay. Inbreeding depression is a different thing. Let's leave it aside. Inbreeding itself is mating between relatives, okay. But how does that change allele frequencies? Both are independent of each other. They are just from that entire pool. They are related. So you cannot directly, both of them are not completely independent. Yeah, they are not independent of each other. That's true. And we can talk about later what exactly, I mean, how do the allele frequencies change by inbreeding? But, okay, that's one possibility. What else? Think about what you might see in populations. Kavita mentioned height. Yeah. Go ahead. Non-random mating. So, you guys know about Mating with respect to height, what's the pattern which we see? There's assortative mating with respect to height, which usually means that tall people usually tend to mate with tall people and shorter people tend to mate with shorter people. So if that's the case, right, if you have non-random mating, then what is it, which part of this assumption is violated? We talked about this whole process of this pool of gametes, right? Not all will go to yeah. The same pool. So the same exactly. So basically, there's a pool, but that pool has a some kind of you know subdivision, right? Where the tall alleles, say pink in this case, are all together. The short alleles are all together, and things like that, right? So that's another way where you might violate Hardy-Weinberg. Any other options? Does height matter? Well, they don't stand up, so there's nothing like height. But uh, there are some species like crabs where they have disassortative mating with something to do with the size of the claw or something like that. So it depends. There are, there's both assortative and disassortative, many examples of assortative and disassortative mating in animals. Um, but you will only know by looking at, say, uh, like you can do a choice experiment where you give an animal, female, a choice between, say, two males or something like that. Oh, disassortative mating is if tall people preferentially mate with short people. And assortative mating is tall people mate with tall people, short people mate with short people. <clears throat> so basically, what happened? If you have assortative mating to the phenotype, <coughs> suppose uh, <coughs> height is distributed like this, what will happen if tall people mate with tall people and short people mate with short people? Huh? Yeah. So you will end up with bimodal you might right have a bimodal distribution right 
What about dissociative mating? You have this kind of a distribution. Huh? What will happen over time? So if these guys are mating with these guys here. Yeah, it might narrow, right? Because they'll have someone who's kind of in between or whatever. So anyway, but that's basically for phenotypic distributions. But these are various ways in which Hardy-Weinberg could be violated, right? And the important thing to remember is that when you calculate allele frequencies, you have to do it for a specific, like you have to basically do it based on genotype frequencies. Right? You understand? You can't see the gametes. You can only see the genotypes. Possibly you can see the genotypes. To assume something about that a specific phenotype is associated with a specific genotype, you can see the genotypes and you calculate allele frequencies based on genotypes. Right? And so you can predict the genotype frequency in the next generation. So let's just do one uh, simple problem. Let me put my bag off. <clears throat> oh, yeah, okay, yeah. I wanted to talk also about. Um, so, the, the kind of, we, we keep talking about these distributions of phenotypes and all. What is the basis for phenotypic variation? Why is it there? Why not everybody be exactly the same? Why do we have variation at all? Recombination. Okay. Huh? Environmental? So why would that lead to variation? No, it can happen that uh, two can have same phenotype, but like if one was having more recession, one was having less recession. No. And still. That's Lamarckian. No. No, like the tree. We make one side tree, right? Yeah. So it actually has a genotype to show some big tree. But okay. then we restricted it and it became a one side tree. Ah, but that's artificial selection. So let's talk about nature. Evolution is playing out in nature. So why is there variation in phenotype? What is the ultimate source of variation? Mutation. Mutation, right? Mutation is the ultimate source of variation. And what does mutation do? Does it increase genetic variation or decrease genetic variation? Huh? How? If there is a variation yeah uh, in back, whatever that variation was mutation brought it back to the previous fine previous that's a back mutation but usually forward mutation would happen first yeah. right so in general mutation tends to increase. increase variation what is variation when we say variation what do we mean we're talking about phenotypic variation right sort of we're talking about phenotypic variation but phenotypic variation will be linked to genotypes yeah. right so if you have more alleles at a locus, you have a specific locus and you have more alleles, will you have more or less phenotypic variation? More. Why? Exactly. There's more like when we had three alleles, you can have six phenotypes. You could have six phenotypes. If the, if the say the one uh, allele is dominant over the other, right? You may not have six phenotypes. Like when pink occurs with purple, it always looks like pink or something like that, right? It depends. But you could have six phenotypes. If you have five alleles, you could have whatever, many numbers of phenotypes, right? So what is it which creates these alleles is definitely mutation, okay? And other things, for example, like migration and so on. 
But when you're talking about variation or genetic variability, so we talked about phenotypic variability, right? Where you have a distribution of a phenotype. So if you see, if you see two populations, One has low variation, this one, and this, this one has low variation. What will you guess about genetic variability? Suppose you're talking about this locus which has pink, purple, and yellow. Yeah, this has more variation, this has less. So let me, maybe I'm being a bit confusing. So this is phenotype, right? So let's call this A, B, and C. So let's say A, 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 B, B, C, A, C, B, B, C, C, or something. That's the phenotypes and that's the distribution, right? So this same locus, beak size or whatever, in this population, you see less variation. So what would you say about the alleles? You go to the population, you see less variation. Phenotypic variation is low. Huh? Okay. One first, your first guess, your first guess would be certain alleles are absent. What else? No, imagine it's an additive trait. That is, each allele ha looks a different way. <coughs> okay, so let's flip that around. For a locus, for a phenotype to have high variability, a prerequisite would be to have more alleles. Okay? So genetic variation is conditioned on the number of alleles. The more alleles you have, the more variation you have. Correct? Because more combinations are possible. What is the other thing which might be true here? Think about those frequencies. Certain combinations are fatal, okay? Or they may not be present, right? So overall, when you, another way for us in genetic variation to quantify variation is called heterozygosity, okay? So heterozygosity, we talked about homozygous and heterozygous. You have high heterozygosity you have high genetic variation. Why is this? If you have more alleles, you have more variation. Yeah, but even if you have only two alleles, heterozygosity itself is dependent on the frequency of the alleles, right? So under what situation, under what allele frequencies? Yeah, you have a question? Okay, but why? Yeah. So basically when P equals Q, heterozygosity is the highest, okay? Another way to think about that is, suppose P is small and Q is very large. They have to equal to 1. When you add them together, P plus Q equals 1, right? 
And because p plus q equals 1, p plus q squared also equals 1. So all the combinations have to be through this and because of this, right? That is basically Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, okay? So if p is low and q is high, then 2pq may not be as high. To plot it out, so p, for example, can go from one to zero, and q can go from one to zero. And if this is the case. This is heterozygosity. It decreases on either side, right? It's symmetric. It doesn't matter whether p is if. So basically, 2pq is the same whether p is 0.9 or p is 0.1, right? Because if p is 0.9, q is 0.1. If p is 0.1, Q is 0.9, right? So heterozygosity is symmetric. And what is the highest value it can be? 0.5, right? 2 into half into half is 0.5. So if heterozygosity, if P is 0.5, heterozygosity is maximum of 50%. So in a population where the allele frequencies are equal, you have the highest proportion of heterozygotes, right? Uh, if population, if the allele frequencies are not equal, you have lower heterozygosity. So how we measure when we talk about genetic variation, heterozygote phenotypes, are determined by these frequencies. And inbreeding, basically someone talked about inbreeding, results in a loss of heterozygosity. OK? As does population structure. We'll talk about that the afternoon. So I wanted to do this one problem. So now let's also just, uh, <coughs> since some of you <coughs> when you talk about actually measuring allele frequency, so here I did a full count. Na? I counted everyone's alleles, genotypes. So when I go to actually do a study, can I do that? Why not? <laughs> Suppose I'm talking about, uh, I don't know, like beak size in a species of bird. Huh? Yeah, you can't catch everyone, and basically, uh, sampling is not based on the idea of ca catching everyone, right? So, okay, he said for every phenotype, we cannot determine the exact genotype. Yeah. That's a slightly different problem. But uh, by looking at the population, even yeah. if you want to study uh, what will be the difference in the next generation, yeah. so by looking at the different phenotypes, we can. <coughs> Only if we know the genotypes. If we don't know the genotypes, I mean, especially, okay, by the way, I said, I don't know whether you guys noticed, but uh, how many, uh, there's six phenotypes here. Will this graph look like this? 
what is i mean something's wrong here it's very continuous right it may not be i mean it will be something like this whatever it will not be so continuous right okay so when we're talking about phenotypes most of the phenotypes we see are quantitative traits what is this this uh, abc type of thing what kind of trait is that for people who have studied genetics it's a mendelianish trait na few genotypes few alleles independent assortment actually hardy weinberg is independent assortment only nothing different right it's basically saying that you have all these combinations of individuals and they'll all mate with each other and you'll end up with the same frequency as you started off right so what was i talking about ha huh. okay allele frequencies so when you go to a population actually first of all you need to know what are the alleles so how do we actually do that how do we study population genetics do people actually look at allele frequencies like that how do they do that are there such phenotypes which are determined like it's a b c or a b kind of thing there are of course there are can you give me some examples you studied mendelian gen i mean you studied genetics right huh which one peas well forget mendel yaar some other things which you see you i don't know you've seen yellow peas and green peas and all i have not seen hair color Red, ha. Uh, black. Okay, red. Red is an interesting example. So, what is you know the genetic basis for red hair color? <laughs> Anyone want to guess? Anyone know? It's a MC1R mutation. Yeah, there are two, but red color particularly, red hair particularly, is an MC1R mutation. But fine, there are certain things like that. There is a single mutation. It may not be all kinds of hair color, but in a population, if you have only red hair and black hair or something like that, then you can talk about an allele for red hair and an allele for black hair. Individuals which have two alleles for red hair have red hair. So maybe it's a recessive trait. Individuals two alleles for black hair or one allele for black hair also have black hair. This is one example like that to do with bears. So, by the way, there's a long history of population genetics. How old is population genetics as a field? Any idea? So, when initially people studied genetic variation in populations, what did they look at? Like, obviously, now we have genome sequencing and all that. and we can do genetics and we can make knockout animals and also we can get a better handle on why pheno what like genetic basis of phenotypes but before that it may not have been possible so people used to look at things like blood groups right and things like that which can be scored and that's why mendel looked at the peas you know but he by the way assumed right he assumed Can you think of another classic example which has been used to study evolution extensively uh, of a trait which may be a single mutation the peppered moths right there's a mutation and oh you guys have to read this paper it's not uh, in the readings but there's just a paper by Hopi Hoekstra where they actually track selection on a mutation with mice in different I mean, in experimental evolution, experimental enclosures with different colors of uh, ground. Huh? I'll send it to you. It just came out in science. Yeah. Yeah, not five months. It's much longer, I think. Uh, but yeah. Okay, 
So the black bear, there's a striking white but not albino color, okay, phenotype. This is called the Kermode bear or the spirit bear found in rainforests along the northern coast of British Columbia. The total number of Kermode bears is estimated to be 100 to 200. They've been protected from hunting since blah, 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 blah. So anyway, Ritland et al. found that the Kermode form was a result of a recessive mutation. So how did they do this? So fine, you go there, you see a white color bear roaming around. All the, most of the other bears are black. Okay? But if you want to quantify any kind of genetic change or evolutionary process, you need to know the genetic basis for what makes this bear white. Right? So how would you do that? How would you even start on something like that? Yeah, so it's basically a white color bear as compared to black bears, okay? So, so yeah, so anyway, uh, you have to do various things, forget it, I just, it's just interesting to think about it. But it turns out that these guys figured out that it was a recessive mutation, okay? Recessive means you need two copies to look white, right? Two copies of the mutation. And it's a replacement of A to G in some position 893 in the, in the MC1R gene, okay, which turns a tyrosine to a cystosine, the two amino acids. So why does a mutation cause a change in phenotype? We discussed it, right? Because the mutation, because DNA is translated into protein, if there's a mistake, in, there's a mutation, there's a mistake in the spelling, the protein sequence will be different. And because the protein sequence is different, the animal might look different. Okay, so the observed phenotype, phenotypic numbers of black and white bears on three islands in British Columbia and the estimated frequency of the recessive allele, blah, blah, okay. <clears throat> so here, so here we have So the first question you might ask is, suppose you see these two kinds of bears, what is the first thing you'll be tempted to say? Suppose you, you see white bears and you see black bears, you see fewer white bears than black bears. So the first, what is the first, what are the first things you might think? Huh? It's a two allele system, okay, we know that, <clears throat> it's a two allele system, right? The alleles are A and B, A is the white allele, okay, so A, A is white, A, B is black, and B, B is black, ah, oh sorry, I thought someone had a question. So, I don't know, but I would think, it must be quite bad to be a white bear, no? Maybe. You're quite conspicuous or something like that. Maybe there's selection, which is killing off the white bears. Maybe that's why they're rare. But how do you know? Maybe the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Right? So this is a slightly different way to ask the same question. You might want to know, is the population in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Right? So if the population of bears is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then probably there is no selection on the white bear. So how will you test for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? You have a population of bears, you can score their genotypes. And for example, you have a 13 white, sorry, 13, 10 white and 13 black bears. It's just the same thing we just did. Don't get confused. Same thing, we're just reinforcing the concepts, okay? So, should I say it again? There are two kinds of bears, black and white, okay? We know that the white phenotype is caused by a recessive mutation, okay? So, what does that mean? <coughs> There are three genotypes, 
A A, A B, B B. This is white, black, black. Correct. Okay. Now I go and count the bears. Ten bears are white. Thirteen bears are black. Okay. So I want to test whether this po population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium because. Huh? Assume that it is in Hardy-Weinberg. Calculate the allele frequency and then recalculate the genotype. And if they are the same, then it would mean that they are in an Hardy. Okay. How will you do it statistically? That's nice to say, but you know we have to be quantitative, right? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. That's the point. Because you, this is just a thought. That's what I'm saying. Population genetics is very theoretical. So the basis of Hardy-Weinberg is this pool of gametes going from generation to the other. But it can be tested in practice, and the practical tests will be statistical. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, I didn't mention it, but yeah. Yeah, the reason it is that way is because everything is coming back together, right? Into that pool of gametes. And within a generation, it's back to the same, right? So now, okay. So how do you start? Okay, someone said chi square. Okay, fine, good, good start. How do you how do you start? What do you need for chi square test? Observed and expected. Okay. So now, what is observed? Okay. What is expected? Fine. Easier. Let's say what is expected. How do you calculate the expected number of white bears, except expected number of black bears? Did you raise your hand? No. Yeah. Equal. La. No. Why should you assume they're equal? But if there's no selection, doesn't mean the allele frequencies are equal. OK, so what information do you have here? What allele frequency can you quickly estimate based on the information you have here? A. What is frequency of A? Huh? 10 by? Frequency of A is 10 by 23, which is, can someone calculate? Okay. This is frequency of genotype. Okay. So then what do you do? Frequency of white is P. And the frequency of white genotype that A has to be P square. Okay. We have that P square is the number is there, ten by twenty. So okay. That we can get P. What is that? What is P? P the frequency of A. What is it? Root of 10 by 23. Okay. What is root of 10 by 23? No scientific calculators. Point 0.2? Fine. Okay, point 0.2. So what is B? What's frequency of B? Point 0.8. Why? Because Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium will assume that these two add up to 1, right? Okay, fine. Now, why did you say this is square root of 10 by 23? If Hardy-Weinberg, expected is because you assume Hardy-Weinberg is true, right? If Hardy-Weinberg is indeed true, the square root of A square should be A, right? Okay. So now you have 0.2 
and 0.8. Point? Oh, okay. So frequency of white is 0 0.7. 10 by 23 square root. Half, square root of half or so. Okay. Okay. Okay, fine. Okay. Fine. And frequency of B? Okay, fine. 0 0.7 is fine. Doesn't matter so much. Is uh, 0.3? So expected allele frequencies you can calculate, sorry, expected genotype frequencies. What are they? Is it? 0.7 square, that's it. Huh? Point 0.9? 0 0.91, 09, and then? Okay, but you guys are ignoring anyway. Okay, fine. Uh, 0 0.21, 0 0.42. Fine? Right? Huh? Why are you adding them? Can you uh, uh, just come, can you do the chi-square like that? No. You need to get observed frequencies here, right? <coughs> so can you do this? How? Sorry, are you getting my, uh, we got the expected frequency. Yeah, we need to do that also. Multiplied by 23, no? So 0 0.91 into 23. Why is it 0 0.91? 49. 0 0.49 uh, into 23 will be around uh, 12. Okay. But what do you want to do about this problem? Huh? Does anyone get the problem? These two are clubbed right here. So here you'll have 12. So can you solve this? How? Oh. Easy, yeah. Expected is uh, whatever. For white, it should be a square into number, right? Which is 0.7 squared into 23. Okay. Everyone understood expected? No. There's no problem with expected, na? <coughs> Similarly, black heterozygote will be 0 0.7 into 0 0.3 into 2 into 23, right? And uh, black homozygote will be 0 0.3 into 0 0.3 into 23. Fine, this is easy. But if, if we are to do the chi-square test, what, what do we have to do? How, how do you calculate chi-square? Anyone know how to calculate chi-square? Yeah, time up. Oh, sorry, sorry, okay. we'll stop. Yeah, yeah, we'll stop.